Um, if I can, okay, I can fix this. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, why not have high assurance, what happened in the past and why haven't we had it and what are the good reasons for that? And then why they visit high assurance now? What has changed uh, since we haven't had it for the last 40 years or so, except for specialized systems, not commodities. Uh, then I'm going to try to make a case for uh, the need for high assurance. Uh, and then finally, what challenges we have in uh, getting to high assurance in some commodity systems and uh, an illustrative examples about how to do it, how to determine that value. All right, so uh, what's high assurance in commodity software? So basically we have to define the term first, uh, uh, commodity software and high assurance. So commodity software is a software that we use in our everyday life. Like for example, Zoom is commodity software. Uh, so it's general purpose software available for, for purchase by anyone on the open market. So uh, it has high volume, uh, lots of sales, lots of copies, low cost. Uh, there is no special purpose software here as for example in government systems, which are designed for particular, um, for example, defense purposes or intelligence purposes, none of that here. So that's commodity software. Uh, high assurance really encompasses just about all the mathematical methods uh, that we use to prove security properties of a computer program or a set of programs. This is, of course, the kinds of things you do here in the Department of Computer Science. Uh, and this encompasses different types of formal logics, uh, number theory, information theory, and the like. All right. So, uh, by the way, there used to be a common criteria for uh, security evaluation, and the highest level of the common criteria are called evaluation level seven. And that stopped high assurance at the design specifications, not code, not binaries. And that was uh, not by accident. Its predecessor, one of the predecessors, was this US uh, criteria called the Orange Book, which again, the highest level was A1. And it stopped at essentially information flow on design specifications. And after that, everything was manual. So you had to do spec to code correspondence manually. And you'll see an exercise like that. If you look at the security testing guideline in the back, there is an appendix about how I did the manual mapping from formal design level specifications to uh, Pascal, which was an implemented, concurrent Pascal, which was an implementation language. All right, so an early example of this, uh, and it's an unusual example, was the proving penetration resistant properties of the secure Xenix or trusted Xenix kernel. So essentially the penetration resistance properties that we had came in five classes. So one was uh, we had to make sure that we had only specific entry and return points and we had to protect them. In other words, you couldn't jump arbitrarily in the kernel whatever you wanted or return from a kernel call whatever you wanted. Um, we had uh, to check the parameters of every single kernel call. And we had checked them for address, for example, the address had to come from a comments address space and it had to have the right, right privileges. In other words, you couldn't call a kernel that required a write uh, to an address in your space where you only had read only, it was a read only file um, and the like. Parameter checking by value. If you don't check the parameter length, you get buffer overflows and uh, the, all the negative consequences. Uh, then we had to check the atomicity of time of verification, the time of use of, particular, of a particular permission. Um, we uh, also had to make sure that user programs will not be able to reach internal kernel programs uh, that could trigger unusual actions. For example, an inter internal kernel program would be something like the panic function. So if I, from a user program, could come up with a, with a set of parameters to activate the panning function, the system would reboot. Uh, and guess what? It reboots. Uh, I restart the computation, perhaps remotely. I do the same thing, and the system reboots again. And it does so forever. 
And by the way, this was a major flaw in the design of the Unix kernel. We found 38 system calls that allow users to do this along about 15 independent paths, flow paths in the kernel. Uh, or another one was an internal kernel function called CopySec. This copied a segment of the memory from one place to another. Well, if I could do that from the user interface, I could actually write whatever I want. CopySec was harder to activate, but nevertheless was possible. Um, finally, uh, all these kernel programs had to be, their activity, their uh, dependencies could not include user level code, because if it did, then the user could essentially take over in some way the kernel. So all these properties were actually checkable uh, and they were checkable by doing integrated flows on the kernel and specifying uh, basically paths and checks that should be done in prologue. And then you could tell if the prologue uh, theorem improvement worked, you could tell if the particular checks were correct or not along the particular path. Very laborious, difficult, largely manual uh, problem. Now, life luckily has changed dramatically since 1990, 1989 and 1990. Uh, so uh, towards the best. All right, so now the question is, why don't we have high assurance? Uh, by the way, the, this uh, examples of penetration resistant properties dimension of C language implementations were actually the first of their type because before this time, all we had were formal uh, specifications or verifications of information flows. Basically, systems that implemented mandatory access control policies, uh, military controls typically, uh, plus information flow to show that you really don't have egregious covered channels. All right, so why not high assurance? Why haven't we had it? Well, so there are three things that, uh, three ideas that have to be pursued to explain this. Uh, and I think these are right. The two of the three were described in 2010 at the security protocols workshop. And uh, one is that high assurance always has high opportunity cost. What we mean by this is high assurance everywhere in the system. Um, so what it says is says there will always be rapid innovation in commodity software, and this would always lead to low assurance commodity software systems. Why rapid? Why always rapid innovation? Three things: zero cost of entry in the software industry or thereabouts, zero regulation, and zero liability. We all sign off the ULO agreements that we use the software as is, no claims. Now this caused the highest rate of innovation per unit of time in human history. Compare it, for example, with more recent phenomena, pharmaceuticals, aerospace, right? Uh, there is innovation, but not anywhere as close uh, to the speed of rapid innovation in, in software. For example, in ph pharmaceuticals, very high cost of entry, uh, lots of regulation, and God forbid you get a drug wrong uh, and you'll see the liability, billions if not hundreds of billions. Okay, so same thing with aerospace. All right, so, so that's rapid innovation will always cause people to innovate fast and not to pay attention to the formal methods that we should apply on code. Second one is that there will always be large commodity software system. Uh, Butler Lamson says that in software only giants survive. So large software systems, I call giant, uh, I call them giants paraphrasing his uh, quote. So uh, what I say here is that there will always be giants whose security properties are unknown or hard to prove even when they are known. An exercise which I carried out between 2003 and about 2014, just about every year I asked my colleagues at Microsoft whether or not there was any single property they could choose, their choice, any single property that they could guarantee of uh, Windows, whatever Windows we had at the time. And the answer was invariably no. In fact, at some point in the early uh, days, I don't even think that there was any one person who understood the entire Windows system. So um, very rich ecosystem, very useful in terms of functions, very poor in terms of assurance. All right, so that's the second axiom. 
The third one is an observation. It's uh, not so much of an axiom, but it's something that, uh, that really uh, held true at the time. This was two papers published by Lamson, uh, AXAC 2000 and uh, Communications of the SM in 2009. And basically he says, look, defenders are rational. By defenders, we mean companies, for example, not necessarily individual users. So what, what it says, it says that defenders notice that high assurance everywhere is impractical. And in fact, Lanza says what they do is they give you an or expected cost of recovery. And the expected cost is the recovery cost times the probability. That's the expected cost. And what they do, they balance this expected cost against uh, the cost of prevention. And prevention is invariably done via what? High assurance. And that means formal methods. So when they weigh this in the balance, Lamson pointed out that there is no uh, contention, right? The balance tilts away from high assurance. It always has been easier to recover. The expectation to recover is always cheaper than the demand high assurance of a system. Okay, so pretty, 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 pretty good observation. All right, so now the question is why is it the high assurance now? You know, what has changed? Okay, so uh, two things have changed. The first one is that the cost of recovery from a bridge has increased substantially over the last decade. So for example, the cost of recovery from cybercrime now is about 1% of the global GDP. That's a lot of money. Uh, when I last looked, this is about $800 billion or so close to a trillion the global GDP being about $80 trillion. Okay, so that's uh, a pretty, pretty uh, good chunk of money. The average cost per bridge has also increased dramatically. For example, the average, according to IBM, an IBM eponymous survey is 4.2 million for recovering from the average bridge. If you use a zero trust architecture, which is supposed to confine in some way the adversary that breach your system inevitably, uh, then you can recover a little bit faster because the adversary doesn't reach as far into your system to damage the system so much. And essentially it drops from 4.4 million to about 3.28 million, about 30% drop, which is substantial. If you use also artificial intelligence methods and tools, then the cost drops even more to 2.9. Why is that? What does it mean to use artificial intelligence yet? Well, essentially, uh, these companies use between, you know, 100 and 200 uh, applications, let's say. And they use between 65 and 75 types of monitoring tools, security monitoring tools. And these are actually different applications. Well, so you have to be able to integrate, to read and integrate there are normally responses. That's where artificial intelligence comes in because not, no individual user or group of users will be able to do it, certainly not in anywhere in real time. And if you do this, if you apply this uh, AI methods and, and tools, what's going to happen, you are going to detect breaches earlier, which means the time to detection is shorter. Consequently, there will be less damage. Okay, so that makes sense. And what was pointed out, what was pointed out that uh, as of 2021, there was a 10% year over year cost increases in recovery from bridges. That's a lot. The growth is, the growth of this cost is fantastic. Okay, second trend is that the cost of formal verification has decreased dramatically. So I listed here a bunch of figures that I found in the literature and we can quibble about them uh, naturally. Uh, but the trend is clear, the cost is dramatically down. So uh, I'll tell you what the objections are uh, that I can think of, uh, that I received. Uh, one is that first, if you look at the numbers, uh, the cost of uh, formally verifying SEL4, which is security enhanced Linux, I mean, I'm sorry, security enhanced L4. Uh, this was about 2013, they estimated to have been about uh, 262 uh, US dollars per line of code. At 2014, Iron Cloud application Microsoft, $128 per source line of code. Uh, our own separation kernel was about $225 uh, per source line of code. And finally, the Evercrypt libraries were about 40 
dollars per line of source line of code. Now, if you look at the top and the bottom, you'll see a factor of one ninth. Okay, so what's the problem with these figures? Well, we don't know the skills of the people who apply the methods. We don't know the complexity of the code. Uh, essentially, we don't know the extent of the code. Uh, some of these pieces were larger, some were smaller. Regardless of all those great objections in comparing these uh, costs, the trend is down and dramatically so. Okay, so it turns out that right now, formal verification of small pieces of software of about 50 to 70,000 lines of code is practical. And I call these pieces of software WIMPs as opposed to giants. So these WIMPs, if you really want to verify them, you must absolutely must isolate them from the cost of their giant and verify them and use them within the giant. Why is that? Because if they're not isolated, the rest of the software flaws in the giant would actually destroy the validity of your formal verification. So the precondition is WIMPs have to be isolated to be, for the verification to be practical. All right, so what you notice here, if this is all true, and as far as I can tell it is, then the balance is beginning to tilt from recovery more towards prevention and high assurance, prevention by high assurance. So that's, what, that's what's going to happen. Okay, so this is an, an observation, but I think this is going to happen from now on. And there is some evidence that is already happening in the industry. Like for example, Amazon Web Services has a lot of formal verification of small pieces of applications which are isolated in the cloud. Okay, so, uh, so that was the first observation. These two trends uh, point us towards formal verification of small pieces. The second question is, how do we select and how much we select to verify? And this process is called selective high assurance. What it means is that you isolate small security critical whims in giants and formally prove their uh, security properties, namely the WIMPs. So that's what selective high assurance is. How many do you pick and how you isolate them and how large they are, 50K, 20K, 70K, is really up to you. But you do it selectively. You have to select this set of WIMPs, like two WIMPs, three WIMPs, four WIMPs, and the like. All right, now, uh, it turns out that this cannot be done arbitrarily. Uh, and the effort has a cost. So let me introduce some very simple notation just to uh, express the conditions for selective high assurance. So the first one is the number of attacks that can be counted by formal verification in a giant. No sense of whims at this point, just straight attacks, B. Uh, the green C sub B of verification is the one-time cost of verifying at most B WIMPs. So in other words, you say, you have B flaws, I have B WIMPs such that there's B WIMPs, each one of them covers at least one flaw. So I need B WIMPs there. So C sub B of verification is a one-time cost of verifying at most B WIMPs. The red, is the cost of recovery. C sub B of recovery, it's a minimum recurrent annual cost um, of recovery from B breaches of the giant. Now, remember that one the form of verification is one time, uh, recovery is recurrent. This is actually pretty interesting because what happens is suppose that you got a, a penetration, a breach. Well, you go and fix it. Clearly, that's what insurance companies pay for. They have you fix it uh, when they insure you. What does that mean? Is there any evidence that we actually fix it completely? That there is absolutely no way to be exploited? The answer is no, because all these fixes are ad hoc. They don't do formal information flow analysis and control flow analysis on source code. Uh, they don't measure the ranges of integers and you, you name it. It's ad hoc. 
So even the flaws that you fix, you fix them in an ad hoc manner. Okay, and of course there are other flaws that uh, appear as well. All right, so with these three things in mind, the question is how can a producer recoup the cost of formal verification for those BWIPs? So the idea is that uh, there has to be a balance. So the balance condition that I have for the selection of WIMPs, WIMPs is very simple. By the way, there could be other balances. I, I have other weaker conditions than this, but let me start with this. So one is that the cost of formal verification of B WIMPs has to be less than or equal to the expected cost of recovery, namely the cost of recurrent recovery times the probability of occurrence, which is one. Why is it one? As you'll see later, uh, we have 42 attacks on the average per year against the uh, average US company or typical US company out of which three succeed. So that's the statistics as of late 2022. And of course, uh, NSA tells everyone, use zero trust because you are going to be breached, <laughs> probability one. So, so the expected cost is really the cost of recovery because you, you know you are going to be breached. Okay, so with this in mind, Let's see if the uh, producer can recover its cost. It looks all right, right? You pay one time cost of verification and you gain a lot. But how does the producer make money? Now, before we do that, let's, let's take a, an example. So B is three, three breaches out of 42 attacks succeed. What's the cost of recovery? Well, the cost of recovery is three. The minimum cost of recovery is 2.9 from the statistics I showed you on the previous slide. Remember, with AI and machine learning, you only pay 2.9 for the average cost per bridge. So let's take that. So it's a minimum. So this gives us 8.7 million per year for uh, those three bridges. By the way, in 2012, that cost was already 8.9 million. So we are close. All right. Now, what about? Producer selection of WIMPs. How many WIMPs and how, uh, what's the extent in terms of lines of code of those WIMPs? So essentially, you have the three WIMPs uh, and you have at, at most 72.5 uh, thousand lines of code, very carefully selected. And when you do the multiplication, three times 72.5 times $40 per source line of code, the minimum cost, guess what you get? 8.7 million. <laughs> So our condition was designed to be satisfied right here by this selection, very carefully designed. But notice that between 50 and 70 uh, K source line of code, it's reasonable. And if your cost is higher than 40, let's say it's got to 80, well, you decrease the size of the number of the WIMPs and you still satisfy the condition. All right, so now let's look at an example. And, and this says, uh, how do you compare verification against recovery? I mean, how do you know what the attacks are? Well, so I'm going to give you two extreme and every, extremes and everything else is in between the two extremes. So two extreme examples. The first extreme, suppose that you have this red giant that has T vulnerabilities. These are T unpatched vulnerabilities that could be exploited. We don't really know what they is, but they are there. And you pick B WIPs, small number and you formally verify their penetration resistant properties. Now assume that an adversary is foolish enough to attack those whips. What will happen? Of course, the attacks are going to be denied because you verify them. So essentially, if you look in this case, if there is at least one user, one defender that uses this code, not M of them, but one, then what's going to happen is that it makes sense for one of the uh, defenders to pay because the cost of verification is a one-time cost. Future years is fine. It doesn't have to pay recurrent recovery costs. And it doesn't matter what the other defenders do. So clearly if the other defenders also pay, the producer makes tons of money, right? Um, now, so this works even if there is only one defender. Typically we have M defenders. We don't quite know what it is because that's the size of the market. 
and each defender uses the software for n years, where n is greater than or equal to one. Okay, so this works. What doesn't work? Another choice is not so good. Suppose that uh, the first defender doesn't doesn't pay the producer at all, and what will happen is he says, "This won't happen to me. This problem won't happen to me." Denial. Well, uh, they will happen. <laughs> with probability one and you'll have to pay the defender will have to pay the recurrent cost of recovery in this year and next year and so on not necessarily from the same flaw but you'll see in a minute could be even slightly different flaws and he still loses more interestingly is uh, another case where the producer controls the number m of the defender ecosystem if the producer can control this m which is very large, meaning he knows exactly what M is. He has that market, right? Then what will happen? The producer can increase, I mean, can increase the price of the product by verification over M, which becomes negligible in M. And guess what? Nobody can compete anymore. This producer is a monopoly, and that's illegal. Cannot do that, right? Just can't. Because if the price is too low and you control the market, uh, at least in the United States, the uh, Federal Trade Commission is going to come after you. And we've seen this at work, right? It's Microsoft. Microsoft was declared a predatory monopoly some time ago, not for security reasons, but for other reasons. Okay, so, uh, so this works uh, and the producer uh, recovers. Now, the other extreme, Okay, you harden those B-wins, but the adversary attacks elsewhere, naturally. So in this case, there will be B successful attacks if he has B attacks against uh, the other areas. And of course, we still have this condition that the cost of verification is cost of uh, recovery, less than. But now the condition for the producer to recover is slightly different. What the producer says, look, I covered BWIMS and I decrease the attack surface demonstrably from T to T minus B. What that means is that I decrease the probability of reach success. How much? Epsilon. Very little. We don't know how much, but there is an epsilon, clearly, greater than zero. I decrease the attack surface, decrease the success probability. Now, one minus epsilon which is the probability of success, multiply by the cost of recovery in the market, that's M and N, plus the cost of verification has to be less than or equal to the entire cost of recovery if you did nothing, right? Because otherwise you cannot justify this verification cost. It has to come out of the market itself. The value has to come out of the market itself. Now, it turns out that if you re resolve this uh, uh, condition, you'll find that the smallest epsilon for which this works is one over n times n, which is great. And now we have the luxury to set our epsilon. Pick your epsilon to be small. Let's arbitrarily set it to b over t minus b. t is much larger than b, right? You, you have t might be hundreds, maybe a thousand, b might be three. Okay, so the epsilon that you set here is small. But you got this condition, T, that unknown set of vulnerabilities is less than B, the number of whims you pick, multiplied by MM plus one. That's great. If you satisfy this condition, then the producer recovers the verification cost. Uh, we'll see on the next slide how to satisfy it because it's not, not trivial at all. Since T is not known, you cannot control M, <laughs> okay? So, uh, so essentially, what the producer does in this case, if the simulation is satisfied, he, the condition is satisfied for some M0, M0, as you'll see, small numbers. The producer says, if I'm going to sell more than M0, uh, then I'm okay. I can actually uh, divide the cost of verification by M, increase the price a little bit, and I'm okay. Okay, so it turns out that all the other attacks possible here are between these two extremes. So between two, these two extremes, the producer always recovers the cost if, for example, this condition is satisfied. 
So how can we tell if it's satisfied? Well, it turns out that we got lucky. <laughs> how lucky? Very lucky. Why? In order to determine T, we have a problem. Why? Nobody tells you what the T is per giant. Remember, T is the vulnerability for that red giant. Nobody tells you that. Of course, if it did, somebody would, they would encourage attacks, right? Because you know that they are attached. Nobody tells you how many giants, how many applications you have per defendant, per company. Nobody tells you in all the surveys how many people in the company reported, although that R is typically one. And of course, uh, you have no idea what the market M is ahead of time, right? This is a priori when you do the verification. You don't know what M is going to be. Okay, so otherwise you're a monopoly. Uh, all right, so with this, uh, what did we find? We found a 2022 report by Resilient, which actually gives you the total number of unfixed vulnerabilities for a number of companies, uh, which is unknown. Right? And you don't know how many giants are per company. There may be 200, there may be 100, we don't know. They didn't report that. They reported the total number of responders, but that doesn't tell you how many companies there are because R per company, small r, could be more than one. So all you know is the green V and the green R. But what do you notice? V is our T, which is vulnerabilities per giant, per application, multiplied by the number of applications per defender, per company, Multiply by the number of responders, which is known R capital R, divided by responders per company. That's what V is. So if you then write T, what you'll notice uh, is something very simple, that R over S, namely the number of responders over the number of services or uh, applications you have per defender, is always much less than one. Okay, great. So T is going to be less than or equal to V over R, which were reported figures. Okay, this is a very large T, but that's okay, right? No, it doesn't bother us. The larger, the better, because we find an M and M, which are the worst case type. Okay, so with this in mind, if you have three WIMS, this uh, resilient report says that uh, out of 634 responders, 47% of those fix 54% of the 1.1 million backlog of unremediated facilities. They fixed 54%, fixed their share of that 1.1. So essentially, if you notice here, what you get, you get V, the total number is, uh, one minus 46, no, I'm sorry, 46 for, 46 for them fixed, 54 didn't. So you get 54% times 1.1 is what was left unremediated. Okay, so we got our R and our V and our T for this is going to be 1,994 unremediated vulnerabilities for the giant. Fairly large number, but that's okay because we want the worst case. Now what happens in this case? Say you are using that software system, the giant for two years. What you're going to get out of this is that M, the number of defenders to which you have to sell as a producer, it's about 332. That's less than 5.3% of all companies registers on the US stock exchanges. That's a small number, it's about 63, at least 6,300. So this is a very small percentage. Now, uh, and if more, more naturally, if these people use their software for about seven years, this number drops to 95. So in other words, if you, if you sell us a producer over 95 copies or over 330 copies, then you recover your cost. Okay, so there is another uh, case here where another example, uh, still using the same survey combined with another survey, we find S, the number of applications if you want per defender, and V is the lower bound of 
unremedied vulnerabilities per defender, which I also report. And you'll find that S is 200 on the average, 200 applications per company, right? And V is over 50,000 unremediated vulnerabilities for this set of companies. V is equal to three. And in this case, you get an M042, very small market. And even smaller, M is 12, if you use this for uh, seven years. Now, these are very, very small numbers. What that means is that for any M greater than these thresholds, the producer ECOPS is now is uh, investment. So what this tells you is that it's actually extremely easy to recoup the investment for those three WIMs. Each WIM being, say, 70,000 lines of code, which means that if you have three WIMs, 210 lines of code, and you do formal verification on them, you can always recoup your cost. Okay, so what, what uh, I showed here is that you can actually do selective high assurance and you can recoup your cost always for selective high assurance. I didn't tell you exactly how to do it, but at least the good news is that you could recoup your investment if you do it. All right, so now, okay. The fact that the producer can recoup his or her investment as a company uh, doesn't mean that it's going to happen, right? It only means that it's, the news is good, but the news will not necessarily materialize. So now what I'd like to show you why this has to be done. In other words, why there is a need. In other words, there is no escape from doing this. It's not just that it's possible, you have to do it. Okay, so what we do is start out with Lamson's equation. Very simple, rational people say, Expected cost of the defender is the cost of the recovery times the probability of the event happening, the breach happening. Pretty simple. So what do we do? We minimize the cost of recovery and the probability. So if we minimize that, we minimize the expected cost. And what we show is that out of this minimization comes the need for high assurance. In other words, this minimization implies high assurance, high selective assurance, selective high assurance. That's needed, right? A implies B, B is needed for A to happen. Okay, so that's a line of argument that I'm going to have. So let's start with probability. So the first thing that we notice is that probability of a breach decreases either with assurance or deterrence or both. These are two separable uh, types of mechanisms. And their separation is fundamental, by the way. I mean, uh, Janet Wing and I showed it about 2011. Lamson argued it intuitively. Uh, but uh, we, we proved it by going into behavioral economics. <laughs> and that's clearly the case. So these are separable components, assurance and deterrence but they are not independent. So if you map this assurance into probabilities of decreasing a bridge by increasing assurance or decreasing the bridge by improving or increasing deterrence, if you map them into those probabilities, those probabilities cannot be multiplied, unfortunately. But of course, what we can do, we can take the minimum out of them and that's our probability that we multiply against the recovery cost. Okay. So uh, there is going to be an upper limit somewhere. So here is what happens. So let's look at assurances. What do we know that we can do? Well, we can implement security functions, formal verification, I mean, verification not formal at this point, monitoring recommendation systems and the like. These are functions. We can implement all sorts of uh, principles in our systems or support principles, like the least privilege principles as in zero trust separation of duty, fail-safe defaults, on and on and on. There are some very good security principles. Implement those. If you do more of this, as you go down, you have higher and higher assurance. And now you go to correctness assurance. And now you have sound models, models with proven soundness. Uh, and you map their specifications into design specification by refinement. 
and you refine again the design specifications into source code, right? And you do the proofs on the source code to show that the refinement holds. And then you even do security testing at the end. So the more of this you do, the higher the assurance and the lower the probability of a breach. Okay, now deterrence. You try to increase the attacker's cost. You try to do detection and response. You try to do audit and punishment. You try to name and shame. The more of it you do, the lower the probability of a breach. All right, so uh, it turns out that there is a way to map these uh, functions and assurances and the deterrence into their respective probabilities. We don't know what the mappings are, but we know they are monotonic, not necessarily strictly. The more you do, the lower the probability is going to be. So that, that's for sure. As I said, not necessarily monotonic, but by doing more, you don't go backwards. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so we take the minimum out of the two probabilities, and hopefully that's going to be below a desirable limit. Now, Lamson says defenders are rational, which means that the probability of a breach by low assurance tends to one. So he kind of gives up on that. We know that that's going to happen. Low assurance means guaranteed breaches. Uh, but he says uh, the probability of deterrence should go to zero. In other words, we should rely on deterrence, he says. He says, in fact, real world security depends mainly on deterrence and hence on the possibility of punishment. This is a direct quote from his 2009 paper. Uh, sure, that's great. Except that we are now told correctly that we might, must assume that our systems are breached. That's what NSA tells us in 2001, and that's what the industry tells us in late 2022. Bit says, look, we did this clearly. Three attacks succeed per year, 40, uh, three out of 42 attacks succeed, probability one. So essentially what happens is, if you wish, there is no deterrence possible against state-sponsored attackers. Why? Because there is no punishment. These attackers are not extradited from China to the US or to Europe or from Iran to England or from North Korea to, I don't know, Switzerland or wherever. They are just not extraditable. There is no punishment. So consequently, you can't deter them, which means that your probability of a bridge is not going to be going to zero, but it's going to go to one because deterrence is not going to help you against a sponsor attacks. Okay, so uh, that was not known in 2009, but it's known today. So consequently, the cost of the defender is really the cost of recovery multiplied by one, by the probability of a breach. So we are done with that probability. There is nothing we can do about it. <laughs> this minimum of the two probabilities. Okay, so now how do you minimize the cost? That's the only thing that's left. Okay, so let's see how we minimize the recovery cost. So let's look at this axis here from minimum to high on the recovery cost, average cost for, per bridge. What do you notice? Well, we notice this survey data is given to us by IBM, which are very widely quoted. People looked at the survey very carefully. If we don't have zero trust or anything else, the average cost per bridge is going to be 5.04 million. The average overall is 4.24. If you have mature zero trust, that drops to 3.28, as we've already seen. And if you use AI and ML, it drops to 2.9, and then you stop. What do you do next? These are, these are recurrent costs. So how do you get to the minimum? Well, it turns out that luckily we know how to get to the minimum by insurance. So if you buy insurance, you pay a premium, but you know that that premium is a market clearing price, you cannot go lower than that. So the cost of the defender goes from this recurrent 2.9 million to a bridge to a recurrent cost, which is very low. Maybe $2,500 per million premium, maybe 10 times more, the premium could be higher. Still okay, still much, much lower than the lowest cost of recovery without insurance. Okay, so that's wonderful. What's the problem? 
more than 50% of the companies that we have, substantially more than 50% of the companies that we look at stock exchange, top 25% of the companies register or all the other exchanges worldwide can afford a lot of them, most of them. In fact, maybe all of them can afford to buy insurance, but they cannot be covered. Why? This is a good question. How could in a society where you balance supply and demand, when you see such demand for insurance, the insurance company don't meet the demand with the supply of insurance premiums? Why, why is that? And why is that gap going to be there with us for next 10 years and probably forever? The reason why is simple. Uh, insurance gaps persist because there are uninsurable cybersecurity liabilities. Nobody would insure them. So the first one is if insurance companies find that you fail to patch uh, known vulnerabilities such as CVEs, you are sunk. They don't sell you insurance. They just won't because you know that you are vulnerable. They, and they probably if you want, they'll have to pay, right? Uh, second, there are a bunch of liabilities which they don't cover uh, inside their attacks. What's an insider and what's an insider is blurred nowadays, but you can imagine what the insurance company's argument is, <laughs> right? Uh, acts of war, that's pretty much non-insurable in any field. What's an act of war, again, is determinable as very recently has been done by courts. So the not petty attack, uh, yeah. There are three quarters. Three quarters, yeah. yeah. The not petty attack, uh, uh, Russian military intelligence against Ukraine was a state-sponsored attack, an act of war. Well, the not petty attack was later, we used to attack Merck. Merck lost $1.4 billion, sued. The insurance companies would not pay because of the act of war uh, game. And they lost, last fall they lost in New Jersey court Two weeks ago, they lost again. So the, now they have to fork $1.4 billion. So as a response to that, now, guess what? They will not uh, cover state attacks that, from, uh, that are sourced or come from state sponsor situations. Okay, they don't cover IP losses. They don't cover third party losses. So this insurance gap will be with us for the foreseeable future. Certainly in the next 10 years, I showed numerically in this paper, but probably more than that. Okay, so what's our situation? Looks pretty bleak, right? Low assurance, probability of a breach goes to one. Low deterrence, probability of a breach goes to one. Insurance, recovery by insurance, not possible in some cases. So what's left? What's left is selective high assurance. In other words, we try to decrease the probability of a breach on the assurance axis by selectively picking wins. So essentially, if you do this, and you say, well, when do I stop? How many wins do I pick? Well, intuitively what you do, you say, okay, stop when the expected cost is the expected cost of insurance that you couldn't get, right? So, uh, so if you do that, then you know that the probability of a breach is going to be limited by this upper limit, which is the cost of insurance over the recovery cost. That's your upper limit. Okay. so. So if you do high assurance, selective high assurance here, you come below this upper limit, you are okay. Question is, how do you come there? So if you go low, low, even better. No questions. How do you get the probability to be below the upper limit? Do you know how to do that? No, not really. Uh, and how high is high? How, how low do you go here? How high is high? Depends on the defender. We don't like that. We don't like to be in the situation to really tell you that your assurance has come before my, below my upper limit, right? So what do we do instead? The challenge is this. Find a defender independent, defender independent value of high assurance for commodity systems. Find a lower bound for it then you don't have to worry about the upper limits, the probabilities and what defenders believe and they don't believe and all that. So the way we do it, we, uh, 
uh, select a set of breaches and find WIMPs for them. And your probability that those WIMPs would be breached go very close to zero. So for those, the probability is going to be naturally below some upper limit. Well, uh, that's based on the hypothesis of formal methods. And this hypothesis of formal methods says this. If you have, if you employ formal methods, you'll have no vulnerabilities. If you don't have any vulnerabilities, there is no possibility of a breach. So the probability of a breach is exactly zero. That's a hypothesis. Okay, how do you interpret this? Well, you look at a set of attacks against selected source code, WIMPs, remember? Um, you apply the formal methods and show what's counted in WIMPs. And the probability of a breach in the selected WIMPs is going to tend to zero. Why not zero? Well, because you do it at code level, for example, not at binaries. But that's good enough for the time being. And finally, how to do it. And I'm going to show you how to do it on the next slide and then stop. Okay, so basically the way you do it, you say, take the source code, which is formally verified, and see how many CVEs you counter. CVEs are common vulnerabilities and exposures. Uh, and if you counter those, you're okay for the waves. What's the value of the CVs, the breaches caused by the CVs? Ask insurance companies <laughs> and they'll tell you that's your value of your formal verification. So how do you do it? Well, we decided to do it on Scion, which is a system designed by Adrian Perry and his team. Uh, it's originally CMU, but was really developed as Zurich. We, uh, it has formally verified properties. We can pick any property and find its value. Uh, known attack surfaces, internet exposure. And we select out of 200,000 CVEs and CWEs from NIST and MITRE, the ones that are counted, define attacks using those CVEs uh, and determine the industry sanction average and they have the value. So here is what the system looks like. And I'll stop with this. So essentially what you have, you have Scion here. And take a security property, which is formally verified. One, not all of them, you do it one by one. Negate it. So you, got, you get some terms out of the negation. Use those terms to query this database of CVs, CWs, CVSSs, uh, and relationships between CVs that you have to derive. So CVA requires CVB. If the sign property counters CVB, automatically CVA false, it's counted. Um, and then you do, you take the CVEs that you found and you determine attacks based on them. How do you do that? Well, use ChatGPT. And when ChatGPT doesn't hallucinate, it will give you attacks which were perpetrated in the past using those CVEs. So, so essentially what you do, uh, after you do this, you get attacks and attack semantics and you get the economic values because you find the value of the attack. Insurance companies, industry surveys give you that. And if you don't have any, just choose your ranges because you want the lower bound. Okay, so essentially you do this for every single property of Scion, which is proven at the source code. And then you know exactly the lower bound of the value of formal verification in SIA, dollars and cents, which the industry understands. And by the way, uh, you can issue all sorts of queries here, like the minimum maximum values, the uh, value of an attack, uh, how many properties does it take to counter an attack, and so on. And uh, guess what? You can use other systems, not just Scion, if you have a tool like this. You can use micro hypervisors plus IO. You can use micro kernels. You can use hypervisors, separation kernels, OS kernel and the like, and you can go through this exercise. So this uh, system is being developed at National University of Singapore by uh, Professor Zheng Kai's Lang's group, uh, with help from Adrian Peg and David Bazin, and a little bit of me. So that's how we determine the lower bound on the value of high assurance, selective high assurance. Questions? Yeah. Thank you very much, Roger.